I'm not gonna lie, flying giant sized monkeys, that's the same as a clown. <laughs> Little people singing Follow the Yellow Brick Road, also the same as a clown. Um, witches in a hunt for shiny red shoes. It's very scary. It's like Christmas time at the mall. <laughs> That's exactly what that's like. Um, something interesting about the Wizard of Oz. Uh, you have uh, Dorothy and Scarecrow. You got the Cowardly Lion. You got Tin Man. And they're all on this journey together, and they're doing what? They're following the Yellow River. They follow, 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 follow the Yellow River. And that's what they do the whole movie. In fact, as they come to meet each other, they end up singing the same song over and over again, which is another one of the things about The Wizard of Oz that kind of makes me feel really because by the end of it, I think there's some kind of hidden messaging going on in that song. I haven't figured out what it is, but I know it's in there somewhere. But as they go, and then they finally get to the Emerald City, and they're there to meet with the great and powerful Oz. And so they're there, they're sitting at the gate, they finally get, they finally let them in, and when they come in, before they can see Oz, what do they do to them? You, oh man, you got to shine them up. Remember the lion and the bow and the whole thing going on? So they had to look their absolute best before they could see the great and powerful Oz. Man, I'm so glad our God's not that way. In fact, God, as we learn in this passage of Scripture we're going to read today, God not only takes us in when we're at our worst, God takes us in when we are lost, and we don't have to follow, 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 follow the yellow brick road. We can be lost in the wilderness, and God is searching for us. Listen to Isaiah 40, verse 55. Listen, it's the voice of someone shouting. Clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys and level the mountains and hills. Straighten the curves and smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. The Lord has spoken. The word desert is something that connected with the Israelites. Because it was like this place between two places. You're here, they want to get to here, and then they end up in the desert. This happens several times throughout Scripture, especially through Old Testament. Old Testament, this happens several times. So when they're in the wilderness, when your Bible says wilderness, it's talking about a desert. It's talking about a wasteland. And literally, people wandering for years and years and years in this dry, desolate place where seemingly there is no hope. So this imagery of the desert is very important in this passage of Scripture because as they're wandering through the desert, through this place where there is no end in sight and where there is this dry and empty wasteland and where there is no hope, there comes a voice. There comes a voice. So there's three things that I want us to look at in this passage of Scripture today. Where? does the voice come from? Why does the voice speak? And what is the voice saying? So the first one, where is the voice heard? It actually says in verse 3, listen, it's the voice of someone shouting, clear the way through the desert. So the voice happens in the desert. This is so true for so many of us. How many of you really feel like whenever things are going great and you're not in the wilderness, you really feel that same kind of connection you feel with God than when you're wandering and you feel alone or you're at your lowest point or that you're broken. How many of you feel that same kind of presence and power from God when you're way up here as opposed to when you're all the way down here? I know in my life, the times that I've been way up here, I almost have to check myself. I almost have to say, you know what? I know things are going good, but it has to be a constant reminder that God is the reason why it's so good. But when I find myself down here, and I have found myself at these low points a lot in my life, a lot in my life, 
Whenever I'm down here and my, I find myself at my most broken, that's when I truly realize who God is and what he means to me. Because it is in that brokenness that I realize that I can't do things on my own. And it's in that brokenness that I realize that only God can pull me up and that only God can save me. So what does this have to do with Christmas? We're a few days away from Christmas. And the birth of Jesus is one of the most celebrated things for us in the church. But do you realize that there were prophecies about that day coming? And there was an idea of how that was going to take place and what that was going to look like. And then when Jesus came, it happened in such an unexpected way, in such an unexpected place, and nobody could have ever even imagined how it was going to happen, when it was going to happen, and the way that it happened. Nobody could have predicted it. But can I tell you that the birth of Jesus and the celebration of Christian, Christmas for us as Christians, it doesn't have to do with what Jesus did while he was here. It has to do with what he is still yet to do. The birth of Christ is just the beginning of the prophecy. And his death on the cross was just the other part of the prophecy. His resurrection was just the other part of the prophecy. But as we're going to hear in a little bit, there is a promise there is a promise that is made to us. There, the last part of this prophecy will be fulfilled. So we hear it in the desert. So the Israelites are familiar with the desert. What does the desert look like in your life? What does that look like for you? Financial struggle? Depression? Addiction? Jerk of a boss. <laughs> Jerk of a pastor. <laughs> um, family issues. Kids are struggling at school. Um, my four-year-old won't stop being a brat. Well, ours is five. I wasn't talking about ours. He's perfect. Said nobody ever. <laughs> That kid is far from perfect. Go upstairs right now. I guarantee you. Jeff will tell you he's not perfect. Something's probably already happened. You may feel like today that you're in the desert. Or maybe you feel like you've been in the desert for a thousand years. Or maybe you feel like there is... How many of you have ever been in some place so flat that you could just see for miles and miles and miles and miles and miles? Can you imagine standing in that flat place? We live there. <laughs> yeah, we do kind of. But can you imagine? Can you imagine? Can you imagine living in that flat place and being and looking out over it? And that flat place is nothing but your struggle. And there is no end to it. Can you imagine being Israelite, being an Israelite and walking and walking? And walking and walking and walking and nothing ever changes nothing ever looks different nothing ever it's always hot it's always dry there's never enough food we're never going to get to where we're going can you imagine just walking and walking and walking and walking and walking going to sleep waking up and walking can you imagine following the yellow brick road and following the yellow brick road, and following the yellow brick road, and just going and going, and nothing ever changes. It's always the same. But then finally one day, there's a voice. There's a voice in the desert. There's a voice that's calling out to us. And not just calling out to us, it's God's voice seeking us, looking for us trying to find us. Because I will tell you, my friends, that God does not want us there. He does not want the same thing, the same struggles, the same battle. God doesn't want you to live in a place where there's no end in sight. God wants you in a place where He is the end. He is the beginning. He is the middle. He is everything to you. Where we've been withering away, the voice
voice cries out, Hey, you. <laughs> Follow me. Hey, you. And sometimes that scares us. Sometimes that startles us. Sometimes that really freaks us out. Hudson has started this new thing where he says, You freak me out. <laughs> like, he used to say, I'm scared, you know. But now it's, You freak me out. Um, how many of you have ever been freaked out by God? I get freaked out by God on a daily basis. A couple of weeks ago, we had our board Christmas party. And while we're sitting there having a board Christmas party, we kind of have the same, the same thing that Doc, Dr. Russell has going on. We have a man come and knock at the door. And he just, we invite him in, and he sits, and he's having dinner with us <laughs> at a board Christmas party. Um, he may not ever come to our church ever again. But on that night... We got to be Christ to him, and oh, by the way, he got to be Christ to us. It has nothing to do with, the birth of Jesus has nothing to do with getting something out of Christmas. It has nothing to do with us receiving something. It has everything to do with the sacrifice that he was willing to make. From day one, that was his purpose. That was his purpose. Okay, so number two. So we talked about, uh, you know, where the voice cried out, but why? Why does the voice cry out? Verse 2 through 4 says, listen, as the voice of someone shouting, clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys and level the mountains and hills, which obviously is no problem in Oklahoma. <laughs> Straighten the curves and smooth out the rough plains. A super highway. It's a super highway, just for God, just for God. What does this mean? This passage of scripture literally, literally is talking about clearing out sin from your life. How can you make a highway for the Lord if you are unwilling to let go of your sins? How are we ever expected to be able to prepare for God? Okay. <laughs> This happens at our house. So, guys, what I'm about to tell you will bring up all kinds of frustration and anger. But I need you to just hang on for a second because it's a cool illustration. How many of you have ever had guests coming over to your house? Okay? And how many of you, guys, your wives, freak? How is this guy? It's got to be vacuumed. There's got to be dusting. There's got to be, we got to clean the bathtub. Why? Are they going to be taking a bath at our house? They might look in there. Hopefully no one's taking a bath when they look in there. But the bath is going to be clean. The shower's got to be clean. How many of you have ever gone to someone's house and pulled back the curtain to see how clean the shower is? <laughs> Bill, I need counseling. <laughs> so, anyways, um, so last night, no one's going Last there. night, Why are you cleaning our washer dryer is going out, go and um, we call my father-in-law <laughs> over because he's <laughs> captain fix it. And so here we are. We we have a washer that had been leaking on the floor all day, and we had a dryer that literally sparked at Abby, like a spark came out of it. And so, and so. Those are huge concerns, right? This is the real problem that we're trying to get fixed. But we have to straighten the house. Because my mother-in-law and father-in-law are coming over to look at stuff that's been making a mess all day. So we're going to clean up. We're going to clean up just to make a mess again. But this is what we do. Why do we do that? Because, and, and guys, here's where we're stupid and we just don't know. These ladies do this and they want the house clean because the people who are coming over, we want to tell them that they are important. So we can usher them in to a welcoming, clean place. How is that any different for God and your heart? There are plenty of people, and I'm one of them, that can stand to use a mop and a broom and a duster in my heart when it comes to God from time to time. 
we have to be willing to move things. We have to be willing to move books off the bookshelves to, yes, dust under the books. <laughs> we have to be willing to take things away from places inside of us so that we can say, I choose you, God. I'm letting go of this because I want my heart to be a welcoming place for you. And that's what this passage of Scripture is talking about. It's talking about building a superhighway. It's using terms like remove the hills, remove the mountains. But what it's really saying is, is remove the sin, remove the anguish, remove the fear, remove the heartache, remove the temptation. Remove it all out of the way so that God has room to come in to a place where he can not only come. God doesn't just come in and sit on his easy chair. And say, okay, I'm here. Bring me a Coke. That's not what God does. God has to have room to come in and work. Because like we talked about last week, we are the clay. And he is the potter. He has to be able to move. We have to be willing to let go of this so he can shape us in a way so that we can get to here. But before we can even get to here, we have to be willing to move this out of the way. So that he can bring us to this point. Now, that, Pastor, that sounds like a lot of change. Yeah, it does. And it is. But it's all good change. <laughs> you, know what, you know what sounds like change? Change is <clears throat> this idea of a Savior who's going to come to this earth on horseback with a sword that's going to slay all of our enemies. That's not how it happened. He came as a baby. In a manger with animals, stinky animals. <laughs> That's not how it's supposed to go, but it's different. And oh, by the way, how awesome is it? Here we are, 2,000 years later, and he's still saving. He's still justifying. He's still bringing life to death. People are, have gone, my grandma has gone into, into, into eternity, and she's with him today. Because of what he did so long ago. Don't wander in the desert. Don't feel like you're wandering in the desert. Because if you're not, you have a God who has gone before you. He's been there. He's been with us now. And he's even in front of us. Look to him. The view changes. You won't be in a dry, desolate place. You won't be alone. You won't be facing the same thing. You won't be following the yellow brick road. <laughs> but sometimes we focus on all the wrong things. Sometimes we focus on how we look on the outside. Sometimes we focus on the way we have to appear at church. Sometimes we, have to, we focus on the way that we have to appear in public. Sometimes we focus on us as opposed to looking on the inside and focusing on what God needs to do with us. Remember this passage of Scripture, Matthew 23, 27, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Man, I got chastised once by my youth group because they said I called them hypocrites. I did not, the Bible did. <laughs> you are like white, we are like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside, they're full of dead men's bones. So we look the part, we play the part, but we don't allow God to come in and clean out the dead things of our lives. So on the inside, we're nothing what God wants us to be. Because we won't let go of the things that we're trying to hold on to. I love this last one. You got you guys, it's whenever. Whenever we go through these things, and whenever I'm putting sermons together, I'm never 100% sure how they're going to turn out. But the third point for today is, is what does the voice, the question is, is, what does the voice promise? So we have, we have, what does, where does the voice come from? Or where is the voice? Um, what, why does the voice say anything? But now let's talk about what it says. There's this promise in verse 5. It says, Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. 
And that last little line there, uh, the Lord has spoken, is a huge thing because this passage of Scripture now has that final little imprint on it that, so who was the voice? The voice is God. The, the voice of the Lord has spoken. Has the, has the voice of the Lord spoken in your life lately? And if he has, what has he said to you? The voice of the Lord has spoken to me several times in this past week. And there's one in particular thing that he has said to me that has just brought me to my very core. And it's one of the things that we need to hear, especially this time of year, but even throughout the entire year. But at Christmas time, we need to remember that it's going to be okay. I worry about things. I struggle through life just like all of you do. I have to be reminded on a regular basis that it's going to be okay. Life is hard. Things come at us and Sometimes we don't know 100% how to handle those things. And sometimes there is no way of handling those things. And sometimes there really are no answers to why things happen the way that they do, as far as we know. But you know why it's okay? Because God has those answers. God has those answers. God's taking care of those things. We never, the, <laughs> the people 2,000 years ago, they kept hearing this idea of a prophecy of a Savior coming. And they would get stressed out and freaked out when things wouldn't go the way that it was supposed to go. But as we know now, when we look back on that time, and we saw Jesus as a baby, and then Jesus as a child, and Jesus as a man, what did we learn? Everything was okay. Everything was okay. God had a plan. God had a purpose. God had a will. God had a way. So my version of this passage for you today is, is, listen to the voice. We hear it in the desert. It cries out because we need to find ways to make room and preparations. We have to change who we are and what we want and give way to what God wants. And when we do that, the voice's promise is that we will see God's glory revealed to us daily and we will get to live with him in eternity. That's what this passage of scripture is saying today. So since we have the promise of the Lord, I think it would actually make sense to talk about this fear thing. Because we do get afraid from time to time. I have a great video that I want you to see. How many of you like Charlie Brown? Big time Charlie Brown fans. I love Charlie Brown. I really love Linus because of what we're fixing to watch from Linus. But those of you that are Charlie Brown fans, think back to any time in a Charlie Brown series. What does he always have with him? His blanket. And actually, he never lets it go. Because it's his safety. It's his security. It's his safe haven. There's even a time earlier in the Christmas one where kids are throwing snowballs at cans on the fence and he puts a snowball on his blanket, he twirls it around and throws it, and he hits the can, and, all the, and then he walks off like a boss. He's like, whatever. That <laughs> and, and all the kids are looking at him like, what was that? But that's his security. It's his safety. It's the thing that he doesn't need to let go of. But watch this video, and pay attention to what happens when he says, fear not. Can you play the video for us? Who knows what Christmas is all about? Sure, Charlie Brown, I can tell you what Christmas is all about. Lights, please. And there were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night, and lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. And the glory of the Lord shall round about them. And they were sore afraid, and the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. 
For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God, and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. There's no room for other safety and security when there's God. He's all you need. <coughs> Fear not. Fear not. Don't be afraid. Everything's going to be okay. I'm going to have the worship team come again, and we're going to sing one more song, and then we'll be dismissed for the day. Um, if you could stand with me. <coughs> and bow your head in prayer. I'd just like to sit for a few minutes in silence. I want you guys to just have time to listen to what God might be saying to you this year. <coughs> Thank you for this good day. And all God's people.